Good evening, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here. To those on Zoom, I have very bad news for you because after the lecture tonight, we are going to be serving a Gilded Age drink called the Newport. Wait a minute, wait until you hear this. It's gin and two types of vermouth and an orange peel. So hopefully you will all drive home safely. <laughs> And I'm sorry to those of you on Zoom, but you can experiment at home if you'd like. Uh, we cannot do these programs without you, so your support really means a lot. Um, we, we so appreciate it, and I thank you. Uh, I want to draw your attention to the March 2nd lecture coming up soon. Um, we're looking forward to it because the orchestra that played in the TV show, The Gilded Age, is going to be performing that night at the Breakers. And it is going to be um, led by two people who last summer spoke in Newport, uh, Dr. Mark Stickney and Dr. Christopher Brellix, who is the person who in the TV show um, does the conducting. So that is gonna be a fantastic night and we're looking forward to it. And I hope you, if you haven't signed up, please do so either for um, attending in person or, or coming by Zoom. Uh, by the way, are there any, are any of you members of the Preservation Society? Oh, good, great. Well, if you are not, uh, we have a membership group outside the door, and they would love to talk to you about supporting the Preservation Society and what you get for it. Uh, that's my pitch. Um, tonight, we come together to hear uh, Dr. Cecilia Tishy talk about her lecture called I'll Have Another. Cocktail Culture in the Gilded Age. Dr. Tishy is an award-winning teacher and the Gertrude Conaway Vanderbilt Professor of English Emerita at Vanderbilt University. She has books um, that range from 17th century history through recent times. She has a book about Jack London, a biography of Jack London, a book called Civic Passions that profiles seven activists who um, fought the tumultuous fight during the progressive era in the 1910s. Her books have been reviewed in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Publishers Weekly, and elsewhere. Her work has been supported by the Rockefeller and Mellon Foundations, and she has held the chair of modern culture at the Library of Congress. She's lectured throughout the United States and internationally from Europe to East Asia, and she has written a book called What Would Mrs. Astor Do? The Essential Guide to the Manners and Mores of the Gilded Age. Um, she is going to sign books after the lecture for those of you who are interested. Um, one of the books that you can get is Gilded Age Cocktail Culture. And the second is a mystery novel called A Gilded Death. We are really delighted to welcome you. A few weeks ago, we did a wow of the day about your upcoming lecture. And Lord Fellows wrote back immediately saying, this sounds so interesting. Because in Great Britain, cocktails were not served until after World War I. It must have been so much fun to be in Newport in the 1890s. So thank you so much for joining us. Hello, everybody. Oh, I, I read the room. Friends, um, my, my earlier notion is that we all had cocktails before the lecture and everybody would be much forgiving. My thanks to Trudy Cox as the executive director of such an important um, organization, the Preservation Society of Newport County. My thanks to, to Kate Petterman, who graciously undertook all of the logistics uh, that have brought me here tonight, and to Benjamin uh, Bowery, who fetched me at the Viking Hotel so I could be here um, on time and so on. Um, just a nod to preservation and the organizations that are committed. In America, I have quipped, we have been raised on raising. So the demolition seems to signal progress 
And all too often, uh, what we have experienced as a nation all over the country is loss. Finally, in the last few decades, there's been a kind of wake up. Uh, and, and at last, uh, there is some traction for the continuity that brings the past to the contemporary moment and to the future. So hats off to preservation. Sorry. Now for the drinks. Okay. I pressed my button and could I have the, there we are, there. The old fashioned, the martini, I'm saying it's gin, it could be vodka, and the Manhattan. And they seem out of time. They seem as if they always were. Um, but let us have a slightly close look. Uh, rye whiskey into the Gilded Age was the most common of the American liquors. But perhaps it's bourbon, and we're not sure. But that citrus peel, probably orange, uh, where did that orange come from? And if you lived in Minneapolis, could you expect in January to get an orange if you wanted an old fashioned? We might know that buried in that old fashioned is a maraschino cherry. And I'm not, not talking about those dyed red cherries. Those are really dreadful. Uh, but the maraschino originated in Croatia. Uh, and so how did it get into that glass? And as for the martini, there are Gilded Age recipes that call for Gordon's gin. And that, of course, had to be brought. And then we come to the Manhattan requiring, requiring Italian vermouth. And it was not made in Little Italy. So where? Where did these ingredients come from and how did it come to be that these drinks that have survived the Gilded Age came down through prohibition and into what I call the 50s, but others call mid-century and to this day, and to this day. So what we have to realize is that these cocktails were actually inventions. So let us see first the figure who, who titled the age. And here's a picture of, of Mark Twain as a younger man. The white suit is decades into the future and was in 1873 when he partnered with, with, with Warner um, to co-author that book, The Gilded Age. And we see it's a, a gemmed ring rather clever, The Gilded Age, a tale of today. I don't know how many in the room have, have uh, read the book or part of the book. It's not Twain's best. It was his first foray into long fiction. Uh, there is one moment when a leader, a business leader says to his uh, colleagues, we need the best whiskey. That's about it. However, uh, a plague of lobbyists infests the world of 1873. Uh, and there's a conniving woman who's, who's villainous, doing her best uh, to, to uh, enrich herself through her amours. So in short, all of the, the sort of con jobs that we see today uh, were there in the Gilded Age, but it is a book that somewhat stumbles. However, Let's bear in mind that the same period in France, known as the Belle Epoque, everybody having a good time, beautiful, and in Britain, the Edwardian era, named, of course, for Prince and then King Edward, only does the Gilded Age capture some sense of social criticism, the glittering surface, glittering like gold, and underneath a base metal to comment on our, on our society at the time. And I've sometimes asked women students, would you like to have a gilded uh, piece of jewelry given to you on Valentine's Day? No, is the answer, no. Um, so the Gilded Age, it was also called the Age of Enterprise, 
and the age of steel and steam. But what won out is this, a gilded age. So where did that word cocktails come from? Our first thought is roosters. Um, now, it's a debatable point, and it's been discovered that even in the 1700s, the word cocktail was in use, but I found most persuasive um, this, this idea of purity versus a kind of contamination or impurity. Notice the, the horse with the long flowing tail. That is a thoroughbred. I don't know what horse. Thoroughbred, an American saddlebred perhaps, certainly not a cowboy horse. It's a horse we could imagine um, on Derby Day in Louisville. But its partner horse on the lower right has had its tail cocked. That's the signal that that horse is a mixed breed. Um, it must not be bred with a pure bred horse or it will contaminate that horse. So the cocktail comes from some sense of impurity and adulteration. So if the cocktail is going to be invented, what might delay or impede its invention? We know who this is. Yes, Poe. And when he deceased in October of 1849, a New York newspaper said, many persons will be startled, but few will be in grief. Because Poe was held up as the example of the dissolute wasted life, the literary achievement to the side, his addiction to drugs, but mostly to alcohol, it was said, ruined the man's life. And he's held up as an example of what must not take place. Here is America, such a practical minded country on the move. Now we know that from colonial days, Beer was a beverage that, that allowed people to escape the perils of water, whatever might be in that dodgy water. So a lot of beer, Franklin, Benjamin Franklin accepted. He, he you know, proclaimed himself um, a, a water drinker and did just fine that way. But, but 10 nights in a bar room, um, that tale often on the stage and in a book and in the course of 10 nights, a man of respectability, business, livelihood, wife, children, step by step, his life ends at the bar. And so, of course, we have temperance, the temperance movements up through, up through the 1900s. Um, and, and gaining strength, gaining strength. Um, those from New England who studied some, some um, Puritan colonial literature might know that the Reverend Dr. Increase Mather wrote a pamphlet called, Woe to Drunkards. So, so taking hold, um, a great prohibition against alcohol and Poe as the, as the, the, the figure who can best represent the life gone to smash. Now there's another, there's another um, problem um, in developing cocktails and that is, is, as we see two bottles presumably containing pure liquor that would be corked and a man at the bar requesting a whiskey would have it poured from the bottle straight in front of him into the glass and downed purely, without adulteration, without contamination. Now we know that 1920s threw that all in the cocked hat, so to speak, as people drank whatever. Um, but, but the idea of purity in the whiskey bottle was a principle, a first principle. So the dissolute life from alcohol and then the quest for purity. Think of that horse with the long tail. Think of what's in these brown bottles. If there's adulteration or contamination, the bartender or the tavern keeper stood 
to come before the law. So think back to those three cocktails, the maraschino cherry from Croatia, the Gordon's gin, the Italian vermouth. How did they get here? Just a little, little crash course, you know, cocktails 01 <laughs> um, um, from Ireland from Britain, Scotch whiskeys, Irish whiskeys from Ireland, uh, from the Caribbean, the rums, the Curacao, um, from Italy, um, from France, Italian vermouth, French vermouth. So if not the ship, then to the shore, and here it is the railroad. This is supposed to actually puff forward, it's not puffing. Uh, I asked for five seconds of puff. Um, so, but a steam train, by the 1880s, America had 90,000 miles of track. Um, so the ship to the ports, from the ports to the rails um, uh, and off to out America bringing, oh look, oh, 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 wow. Uh, we know too much about the railroads, don't we, tonight? Mm. Um, okay, there. What we must have. Um, the citrus fruits, the limes, the lemons, the oranges, and of course, probably from Hawaii, the pineapples. The pineapples. Um, the name Dole, um, a landmark name from the Hawaiian Islands. All the, these fruits to be conveyed for the bartender who will dare to use them and for the imbiber who will dare to try a cocktail instead of a whiskey straight out of those brown bottles into the shot glass. This is a sugar mill on the island of Maui. It is the last mill um, and I put it up here simply to say that the children of the missionaries who Christianized the Hawaiian Islands were interested in the manufacture of crystal sugar, the names Spreckles, the names Alexander and Baldwin, uh, entrepreneurial. And in 1876, this is three years after the publication of the Gilded Age, in an agreement that America made to establish coaling stations near the Pearl River in Honolulu in exchange for which sugar could come into the United States duty free. If you've been to an antique shop here in New England or elsewhere in the South, you may see what is described to you as a sugar safe a wood box with a lock and a key. Inside would be a sugar loaf. Sugar had been scarce. It was doled out, not amply, but in measures, small measures, and kept under lock and key. But as of 1876, it was flooding America. Therefore, the simple syrup that could go into the old fashion could be nationwide and cheap. So what then is required for the cocktails? What broke the ice? Because the very first adulteration of the whiskey, no one knows who did it, but it was ice. Someone discovered that a few chunks of ice chiming against the glass, cooling the whiskey, were pleasing to the taste. And that was the beginning. And of course, it's the era of the Iceman. And there are the tongs in the lower left um, once or twice a week. And in the houses here, the cottages, those ice chests, those enormous ones uh, supplied amply. It was in 1873 that the largest plant ice manufacturer was. If I asked for a guess of what city, I doubt that hands would go up to name New Orleans. It was New Orleans and in Twain's Life on the Mississippi, Mississippi, he marvels at these crystal clear blocks of ice. 
knowing that previously ice had been used to preserve perishables, of course, and cut from frozen rivers and streams and ponds. Um, New England, one of its one of its most successful products, apart from granite, uh, was ice shipped all over the world, but suddenly it could be manufactured and crystal clear. And so the ice man cometh, and so did the bartender. Now, I have two figures I'd like to call attention to as, as favoring the ice chips. And we know who this is, uh, Ward McAllister. In the book that just about did in his reputation, um, society as I have found it, which alas, society realized was a, man, a manual on how to social climb. Um, nonetheless, a very important figure in Newport history, you know it well, um, and in American history as well. When Ward McAllister died in 1895, newspapers all over the United States carried memorials, obituaries, um, in praise of his of his civilizing of the United States, of setting a standard uh, for dining, for, for hospitality. But I'm calling attention to what he says to do with chilling champagne bottles. Layers of rock salt and ice, layer, 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 up to the neck, up to the neck, careful not to, not to let any of the ice get into the bottle just yet, just yet. The ice was freezing in the neck, only the neck. So when the champagne is poured, not in flutes, but in those bowl-shaped champagne glasses, the first ones, uh, the little chips of ice would delight the palate. Everybody loved them. So I say that Ward McAllister has first call on icing. But this man, is the founding father of the cocktail and all the histories of cocktails, and there are a lot of them now, um, in this country, hail Jerry Thomas. Born in Connecticut in 1830 and his parents hoped that he would enter the ministry. You're looking at his ministry. <laughs> And what we're looking at, and this is about as good a, a, a representation of him as we have. I have not ever seen a photograph. If any of you find one, please, um, I can be, you know, through Vanderbilt, um, ask Trudy Cox, she'll put me in touch. This drink um, was invented when a gold miner came in on a blustery cold night from the gold fields. This is the we're talking the gold fields starting from the gold rush of 1849, but decades after. They wanted to know, was there still gold? Could there still be gold? Um, and of course, um, Mr. Mr. Walsh found that gold in Colorado. But this guy came in to the bar and said he wanted something that would send a streak down his gizzard, which was dry. And what would bartender Thomas provide? This, I guess, lithograph does not show Thomas's diamonds. He wore cufflink diamonds with French cuffs. He had diamond studs down his front. He wore diamond rings. Uh, and the drink he invented when he called for two silver mugs with with insulated handles, wood handles, scotch whiskey, boiling water, a teaspoon of sugar, and a lemon slip peel. Um, light the scotch and send it sizzling down in a blue arc. And the blue blazer, that is the blue blazer. He was adept at them. The gold miner was happy. I have asked bartenders, have they ever made one? And sometimes I hear a modest once. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, Jerry Thomas tended bar, maybe first, about a block down from the P.T. Barnum Museum in Lower Manhattan. He got some of his chops there. 
he began experimenting with the mixtures of the whiskeys and the vermouths and the garnishes and the fruit juices. And he first published a little pamphlet with 10 very modestly uh, presented cocktails. And they just had a little, maybe a bit of ice and a little spoon, spoonful of vermouth, but he expanded. Uh, and in the late 1870s, he published uh, a full book of over a hundred cocktails and the subtitle was The Bon Vivant's Companion. He tended bar at New York uh, and then in also in Virginia City, that silver boom town in Nevada, in San Francisco, uh, and for a while in London. He invented the Tom and Jerry, inverting his name, Jerry Thomas. Um, and it's from, it's from Jerry Thomas uh, that, we, that, we, that we realize the cocktail was taking off. People were liking them. Um, men and bars, and let me say right now, these cocktails were for men only in any public dining room, in Delmonico's, in Sherry's, in the Waldorf Astoria, whether it was the Waldorf or the Astoria or what became known as the hyphen, um, ladies must not have cocktails. More about that a bit later. I would like to leave Jerry Thomas uh, there pouring his blue blazer and sort of sketch, ask us to sketch who were his followers and his, I won't say peers, because he set the course. Um, what was going on elsewhere? Think of the map of the United States. Let's start with New Hampshire. In Hartford, two brothers, bartenders named Hubline, were thinking of the possibility of marketing pre-mixed cocktails in bottles, and they would be probably for home use uh, in households where the butler or the footman or the host um, was somehow not able to mix the proper proportions. Wouldn't it be nice if such gentlemen or their servants might pour a Hubline branded cocktail? So there goes Hartford. We could move down to Manhattan. What's going on here? Well, first, in the Hoffman House, the hotel, in the bar, there was a mural of a very naked lady, sometimes known as the bar nude par excellence. The men at the bar didn't have to be so gauche as to turn and stare at her because they would order a cocktail and across the bar, they would see through the mirror, the reflection that they wanted to see. The Hoffman House is credited with inventing the Manhattan. And the Hoffman House's recipe called for Irish whiskey. So, um, so that's going on. Meanwhile, at the Waldorf, uh, very well-liked bartender, very inventive, a man named Johnny Solon, able to, it seemed, invent a cocktail on the instant. He was mixing a cocktail known as the duplex when a waiter from the, from the dining room came up and said, Mr. Solon, I have a customer who dares you to mix a cocktail right now. Solon took it up, he mixed gin, and orange juice fresh and some vermouth and dashes of bitters. And he named it the Bronx. Why? Because that afternoon he had been with his children at the Bronx Zoological Gardens. That cocktail took off and soon crates of oranges were delivered daily to, to the back door of the Waldorf. And perhaps if he had known of the popularity of that drink, Johnny Solon might have named it after himself. Because as we, as we venture down to New Orleans and let's say 
Oh, wait, no, not yet. We're not going there, Ned. We're stopping on Derby Day for the Kentucky Derby. We're going to Louisville. And there, Tom Bullock, a black man, is at the Pendennis Club mixing the juleps he is perfecting. Bullock would later be lured to St. Louis, where at men's clubs there, he also perfected the juleps that became his trademark drink. And finally, in the 1910s, he published his own recipe book. I'm sure the gentlemen of the Pendennis were sorry to see him go. A club, of course, lively to this day. Now we'll go to New Orleans, uh, where Alice Roosevelt said she would not bear to try a cocktail. How dreadful, she said, doubtless at Commander's Palace, where she was taken uh, during a trip. It was a stopover on a diplomatic trip uh, to Asia, and she enjoyed herself uh, in the care of the, of the family who marketed Tabasco's, the McElhenney's, yes. Um, but there, there, Henry Ramos in the Internationale Hotel, but mostly a libation center, Henry Ramos realized that an egg white with gin and flower water and a few other sweeteners and some bitters shaken to a fairly well would froth up and he named it the Ramos Gin Fizz. Within a few years, and you know what whipping up an egg white is about. Come on, come on. There were a dozen heavily muscled bicep young men down that bar. They were known as the Shaker Boys um, because the Ramos Gin Fizz had become that popular. Uh, up the river to Kansas City, the newspaper proclaimed it the best drink ever, and it was named for the man that Johnny Solon never had the foresight to name for himself. Okay, now we're taking our trip into San Francisco to, to uh, Montgomery Street, to an old bank building that got turned into a sort of resort for gentlemen, including ship captains. It seems that some of the gold hunters from the gold rush days had come up from South America, even from Peru, and they liked a certain grape, the Rosa, uh, a Peruvian grape that was exported out of the port of Pisco. And it was, it was heavily um, um, flavored in the same way that the maraschino proper, maraschino cherry was. And so that Pisco grape, as it was being called, and it was brought up in containers that sort of came down to a point, um, really in a kind of masonry. But on, on Montgomery Street, the Pisco, Pisco sour became a great favorite, a great favorite. Uh, so, and Gentlemen bartenders, let me say this, because I'm circling very quickly back to New York, a man named William Schmidt, who had the temerity to charge $5 for the cocktails he mixed in a bar near the Brooklyn Bridge when cocktails typically cost 15 cents. It's, a, it's the equivalent of about $135. But I bring up Schmidt and I could bring him in, in sync uh, with, with Mr. Jerry Thomas. Both of these gentlemen bartenders um, made a point that the cocktail was to be sipped. It was not to be overindulged in. It was a creation that was new for a different kind of drinking, um, very slow. The cocktail was an aesthetic creation um, and it must not be mistaken for the for the down the hatch drinking from those brown bottles had nothing to do with that uh, and only for those who could appreciate the opportunity to sip over a long period of time uh, and savor these wonderful beverages those were the people who ought to imbibe um, and not these others who woefully uh, might have an addictive need uh, or mistake the cocktail um, for 
for uh, for a a what I what is is should I say down the hatch? Here's what I'm thinking. Poor Mr. George Bolt in the Waldorf Hotel and then the Waldorf Astoria. Bolt was a manager uh, without parallel. B O L D T. He had been lured up from Philadelphia. He managed the 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 bars. What he found is that the kings of pork and copper and grains came in from the Midwest. Um, they liked to see themselves as hard drinkers. And so when they were given these thimble-sized liqueurs and say, what kind of liquor is this? And could not hear liqueur as different from liquor and would command that the bottle be brought to them and a tall glass and maybe some ice. And down, down did they down these. The, the, um, the accountant was happy when he saw the results of the 1804 fine brandies, cognacs, French cognacs um, being, being shipped and being slipped um, into those tall glasses. But that's nothing of what Jerry Thomas or Schmidt, or for that matter, Henry Ramos, uh, or, or the gentleman bartender uh, on Montgomery Street had in mind. Nor did they have in mind um, Jack London's order of cocktails in bulk when the most famous writer in the world found that he was dependent upon the cocktails. The cocktails that at his beauty ranch in Glen Ellen, Sonoma, California, just a short train ride up from Oakland and San Francisco, um, Jack London, who initially thought the cocktails enlivened the pre-dinner conversation uh, of the house guests, he and his wife Charmian so often hosted uh, at their beauty ranch. But soon he admitted, and he admitted in a wonderful memoir called John Barleycorn that became his sad companion. Jack London's favorite bartender at the Saddle Rock Cafe in Oakland, where he and Charmian often dined in Oakland at that time, compared favorably to San Francisco as a sophisticated city, commercial, lively. Uh, and the bartender would bottle those cocktails carefully in straw, in bottles by the gallon and ship them up to Jack London and he would start drinking in the morning as he lighted an imperial cigarette and began to write one of his more than 50 books in his short life of 40 years. Um, we're among friends, right? I have tried my best uh, for PBS to undertake an American master's show on Jack London. In the rest of the world, he is greatly admired. In America, he is dismissed as a writer of animal stories for 11 year old boys. The problem is that he was a socialist. When asked, what is a socialist? He said two things. One, aren't we social beings, all of us together? And two, shouldn't we have better governance than we now have? Um, and he, he somewhat preached, um, but he was so popular. He's the first American author to earn a million dollars. Mark Twain did not, did not do that, um, Mr. Clemens. So, all right, enough of Jack London. You may be wondering, ladies, where are the girls? Where are the women? Are there any women bartenders? I'll tell you that I found one. I found one, the daughter of Colonel T.E. Mann, publisher of the infamous Town Topics and its section sauntering, which was lapped up because of the gossip. He staying just this side of legal action most of the time. 
Colonel Mann uh, would charter a private um, rail car every weekend, good weather, and take his editors, their wives and girlfriends, and his stringers who fed the gossip to him into the car. They would have nice drinks all the way up to his, to his estate in Lake George. And starting the next morning, his daughter, Emma, would be at the bar. Um, she would be standing with the swizzle sticks, the ice, the, the ice buckets, an array of liquors, uh, vermouths, uh, uh, bitters, everything. And the colonel would start rousting all his guests with his line, say ducks, ain't you dry? And there was heavy drinking all along. So his daughter, Emma, stepped up to the bar and we don't know who, I think at Maillard's Confectionery in Manhattan, when in the ladies' shopping days, the shopping at, at Siegel Cooper or Lord and Taylor or Macy's or A.T. Stewart's, uh, but in midday at Maillard's Confectionery, uh, ordering tea with a wink, the teacups might contain a cocktail that had been mixed out the back door, down the alley to the bar and brought back and brought back and poured into those teacups and served. And no one the wiser. Uh, Harry Lair reports that in the, the Joneses, Sarah and Pemberton Jones, Pembroke, sorry, Joneses Wilmington house, there were juleps and highballs, and Harry said he felt strangely gay. And I would think so did Sarah and Elizabeth and all the ladies on weekending. So we can imagine that in private, uh, the ladies enjoyed their cocktails, but it was not until the 1920s when the flapper could step up to the bar and, and uh, order what she what she wanted. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to leave us. Come now, you've been good. No, 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 back. Um, um, bearing in mind that the young women of the women's colleges had tea. There was the daisy chain at Vassar. If you are a graduate of Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Columbia, um, Penn, Brown, you should know that there is a cocktail named for you in the Gilded Age, even Brown. Brown, so heavily contributed to by, by John D. Rockefeller, a teetotaler, and attended by his son, Junior, also a teetotaler, who held Bible classes. Um, I looked up what biblical verses he might have, have uh, warned his, his classmates to, um, to adhere to. Uh, what we're seeing here um, is, of course, Commodore Vanderbilt. There were two Commodore cocktails, you should know. Now, I have been um, scolded uh, for for failing to say that the Commodore of the New York of the Yacht Club, the New York Yacht Club, was also called the Commodore, um, and perhaps um, Gordon Bennett uh, would 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 qualify, uh, and and Admiral George Dewey on the left was also called the Commodore, but I prefer to think that the two Commodore cocktails. Um, uh, with with rum or bourbon as the base, were named for Cornelius himself, the great founding figure. We're in his house, so to speak, right now, uh, and there is is J Admiral Admiral George Dewey, named by Congress the Admiral of the United States Navy. We might think of Mr. Berwin and all those coaling stations that helped the Elms come into being. Uh, but, but here is Admiral Dewey, who was presented a diamond encrusted sword by the United States Congress. So I thought as the, as the, the leading um, military figure um, in the Spanish-American War, 
no casualties in the American side, um, a great victory, a great boost. Um, and and um, this will be this will be the final of the two figures. Their two cocktails. By the way, the Commodore, um, uh, the Dewey cocktail was Plymouth gin, um, French vermouth, um, orange bitters. But we have to have a look uh, at the Newport. Come now, be nice. There. The Newport cocktail, there it is. We're gonna be drinking it in just a few minutes. Don't get too antsy, <laughs> just a minute, just a minute. Um, uh, I would like to say that Jerry Thomas invented it. I can't say that. Uh, I found that, uh, that cocktail and many others in a book by uh, Albert Crockett, an, a New Yorker about town uh, he wrote a book called Peacocks on Parade about the politics of New York City, uh, but he lived into and beyond prohibition. And he was worried that a decade plus of bathtub gin was going to, to so overshadow uh, the golden age of cocktails that he took it upon himself to start gathering the recipes of Gilded Age cocktails. Many overlap with Jerry Thomas's drinks, uh, but not the Newport. So we see what you'll be drinking if you so imbibe. Gin, French vermouth, Italian vermouth. Trudy already told us, and here it is. Mixing glass with ice, the gin, add both vermouths, stir, strain, pour into a cocktail glass, squeeze, orange peel, and it's yours. One more, just let me say, I just have to say. Um, so much work in the Gilded Age for so many years, and I just feel I have to stay in it. So yes, I am writing these mystery story, mystery novels. Uh, the first one, A Gilded Death, is set here in Newport in the summer of 1898. It's been found that a lady at Mrs. Astor's annual ball was felled by poison and a poisoner is stalking society in Newport. Who is it? All right, all right, please be tempted, okay. Um, and tomorrow, uh, tomorrow, here it is, tomorrow at six o'clock, I'm going to be at Charter Books, uh, touting my wares, shameless self-promotion. Thank you so much for your attention. Come say hello tomorrow, thank you, thank you. Oh, of course, of course. Thanks. This is water. <laughs> thank, thank you so much, Cecilia, for that fantastic talk. And now we do have time for a few questions from the audience. Oh, right away. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, having gone to college in New Orleans and managed to graduate in four years, <laughs> I can speak as a survivor. You talked about the wonderful Ramos Gin Fizz, which I have enjoyed uh, more on afternoons. And there's the other one that had a very dangerous ingredient of absence. Yes, absence. And I've been to the Sazerac Bar in the Roosevelt Hotel. So could you talk about that, please? Oh, yes. Okay, there's another question. Hold your fire. I know everybody's desperate to go to the cocktails, you know. I want just this much. Um, a man, uh, um, the Peychaud family, uh, living in Saint Dominique, which became Haiti, um, the family felt they better get out of there. And they did. They went to New Orleans. Antoine Peychaud um, developed a bitters compound. Bitters was sold, many of you know this, in pharmacies. It was a pharmaceutical product. Uh, Antoine Peychaud found that a few drops of the bitters he developed, if, if um, splashed a bit into uh, some brandy or cognac, um, was a favorite with customers at the pharmacy. And so began the Sazerac cocktail, which uh, in New Orleans, I have had it at Commander's Palace and enjoyed it. Uh, thank you for bringing it to our attention. Did I do it right? Thank you. <laughs> All right. No, we had a question right over here. I was wondering how the glass was decided. You know, why are they, why are they triangular? 
the glasses. Yeah, for the martinis. I should know, I should know more about the glasses. Um, uh, uh, Schmidt, who who had that that bar for those overpriced cocktails near the Brooklyn Bridge, he listed um, in in his long compendium. His book is called The Flowing Bowl, uh, and he uh, offered advice to bartenders: stack your glasses. And he named some glasses, those with heavy bottoms, um, those with stems and how they could be displayed uh, for eye appeal. Um, uh, I should know more about Crystal. Is there anyone here whose, whose knowledge of antiques extends to Crystal glassware who might give us a word? That's a really good question. <laughs> Can I slither out of it the way politicians do? <laughs> <laughs> I don't see any, I don't see any hands. Oh, there is a volunteer. Oh, good. Oh, darn. <laughs> Thanks. Question. Sorry. Um, I was wondering, you were naming all the Ivy League schools and I didn't catch which cocktail was from there. Um, well, they all had their own cocktails called, you know, the Harvard, the Brown, the Penn. What uh, was the Penn? The Colum I can't remember what was in them. It's in my book. Listen, I've got them all. Um, <laughs> I got so much you know, it's true. When I came up to Newport yesterday, I didn't bring one of my books with me, and it has all the recipes of the college cocktails. So the one, the one that I that I neglected is Columbia. I didn't get Columbia's, and they had one too. Oh, Cornell's. Cornell's is in there. Yes, it is. Thank you. All right. I didn't find Dartmouth. Were you, are you a Dartmouth guy? You were, you were Tulane. Uh, Tulane. Also green. Let, you know, let me say a word about Tulane. Many of, many of you may have grandkids or, or sons or daughters um, in college. Tulane had the, and, and then I'm going to let us all go, I promise. Tulane, early on, because of the drinking culture in New Orleans, um, made an arrangement with the taxi companies. This is before Uber. Um, any Tulane student could hail a cab and get back to his or her residence hall or wherever that person lived and be, would be billed to the university. I thought that was the most forefront of, of policies, and I wish Vanderbilt had been willing to do it, and other schools as well. All right, let's go. <laughs> I think we, do, we must give Dr. Tishy a phenomenal round of applause. What a tremendous lecture. Thank you very much. I learned so much. Bravo. We, we, well, we would just like to say thank you so much to everyone on Zoom for coming out and everyone at Marble House for being here. Please stick around for the book signing in the hall where Cecilia will be in a minute. And also we do have that signature cocktail, the Newport, that will be available as well. Thank you everyone for coming. <laughs>